At this time, we want to welcome everybody to Mount Moriah Baptist Church the way we do it down here.
Not only should you start your day out with gratitude, but you should end your day within the spirit of gratitude. We started out this year thanking God for allowing us to see this year and thanking God for what he was going to do in our lives in 2020. And I think it's fitting that we conclude the, the, the remaining weeks of the year in that same spirit of gratitude, thanking God for his many blessings. The last time I stood before you, which was two weeks ago, I shared a message entitled, Thank God for Forgiveness. We all can be thankful for forgiveness. And on today, I would like to share and remind, with, remind others that we can be also thankful that we are loved by God. Let us go before the Lord by way of prayer. Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of the living God, we come unto you in your precious Son, Jesus' name. We thank you, O oh God, for this day. We thank you for this time of preachment. We thank you, God, in advance for how you're going to utilize this word to lift up some bowed head. It is our prayer that this word encourages some grieving heart. And it's, it's our prayer that this word strengthens someone and enables someone to run on and see where the end is going to be. Lord, it's our prayer that this word points someone back towards you and your saving cross. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray and we give thanks. Let all of God's people say amen. The scripture for this morning's worship experience is John, the third chapter, verse 16. John 3, 16. It's a very familiar portion of the Holy Scripture. And it simply is, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We would like to use for a sermonic title, Loved by God. Loved by God. During the season of Advent, in which we are celebrating, it is beneficial to acknowledge and to remind ourselves and to share with those who may not know that they are loved by God. Before we dive deeper into the sermon, I want to remind someone who may have forgotten what Advent is is. Advent is a period of four Sundays and weeks prior to Christmas. This year, Advent began on November the 29th and will conclude on Christmas Day. The word Advent means coming in Latin. In Christianity, Advent is a time in which we celebrate the coming of Jesus to Christ into the world. Christians use the four Sundays prior to Christmas and to prepare themselves and to remind themselves of the real meaning of Christmas. Christmas is about the coming of Christ into the world. The word Christmas comes from the Middle English word Christmas, which, which in turn comes from the Old English word Christmas, literally meaning Christ Mass. The word Mass is used in the Catholic Church to mean worship service. Therefore, Christmas or Christmas has a, it was a worship service that the Catholic Church uh, designated in honor of Jesus the Christ. Christmas over time has grown from being a worship service to a holy day or holiday to now being a holiday season. Christmas has taken on many shapes and forms and traditions over the years. It has become commercialized and even secularized. However, Advent reminds us of the real meaning of Christmas. That is, it is all about Jesus. Jesus came into the world over 2,000 years ago, and we believe that he is coming yet back again. In this period of Advent, in which we are celebrating and honoring the coming of Christ into the world, the Lord has laid it upon my heart to remind us that the, com to remind us that the coming of Jesus the Christ into the world was to communicate to mankind and to each and every one of us that God loves us. It was God's way of saying to mankind, just in case you don't know, brother, I love you. Just in case you don't know, sister, I love you. Just in case you don't know, young man, I love you. Young lady, I love you. Boy, girl, I love you. It was God's way of saying, I love you. 
Just prior to our text, in verses 3 through 15 in the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, Jesus was talking to a religious man by the name of Nicodemus, who was a scholar who belonged to the group of Jews called the Pharisees. Nicodemus, was, Nicodemus saw the good works that Jesus was doing in Jerusalem. So he met up with Jesus one, late one evening to learn more about this man named Jesus. Nicodemus said to Jesus, we know you must be from God or that God is working through you because no one can do all the good things that you have done unless God was with him. Nic Jesus replied to Nicodemus by saying, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus replied, how can a person be born again? This was a strange concept to Nicodemus because the Pharisee, because he was a Pharisee, the Pharisees placed a lot of emphasis on their lineage, that they, were, that they were the sons and daughters of particular persons or a particular family. They took pride in that. Nicodemus was likely thinking two things. How is it possible to be born again? Meaning, how is it possible for me to enter into my mother's womb again and be reborn? He actually said that in verses 3 through 15 in the third chapter of John. He also probably said to himself, why should someone like me, who was born into a prestigious family, a great lineage, want to be physically reborn again? Jesus quickly realized that Nicodemus was only thinking about rebirth in the natural sense rather than in the spiritual sense. So he shared a short sermon with Nicodemus with Nicodemus about the realities that he should be born again spiritually. And that sermon is found in John, the third chapter, verses 3 through 15. In Jesus' sermon, Jesus wanted to emphasize to Nicodemus that what you have won't get you to the kingdom of heaven. The family that you were born into won't get you into the kingdom of God. But only a spiritual rebirth can get you into the kingdom of God. And that's a word for some of us on this morning. No matter what you may have, no matter how many degrees you may have, no matter how much money you may have in your bank account, or what family you belong to, or even your social status, that none of that matters. And none of that can get you into the kingdom of God. Only a spiritual rebirth can get you into the kingdom of God. Verses 3 through 15 is only a short portion of what Jesus shared with Nicodemus in that sermon in Jerusalem. So the Apostle Paul summarizes Jesus' words by writing verse 16 by saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The first point that the Lord would have me to lay upon, my, that laid upon my heart to highlight to you, you all on this morning is that God loves you, and God loves you a lot. John 3.16 is probably the most quoted scripture in all of the Bible because it communicates so succinctly the purpose of Jesus and the heart of God the Father. The text says, for God so loved the world, the word so can be used as an adverb or a conjunction. An adverb is a word or phrase that modifies or, or qualities of an adjective, verb, or word group. A conjunction is a word that, that is used to connect clauses or sentences or to coordinate words in the same clause. In our text, the word so is used, used as an adverb, which means that it modifies the word that came after it, which was love. Therefore, when it is said, God so loved the word, the world, the word so was used to add emphasis that God didn't just like the world, but he so loved the world. The word, the word, he didn't just love the world, but he so loved the world. The word so means to, means to a great extent. Let me say that again. The word so means to a great extent extent. The text is communicating to us that God, to a great extent, loved the word, the world. Oh, you missed your chance to shout right there. Those five words makes me happy that God so loved the world. 
that God, who is perfect in all his ways, God, the creator of the world, the God who, who, who is named the I am, that I am, the God who set the sun, the sun in the sky, the God who placed the stars in, in, in their places, the God who placed the planets in our galaxy to orbit around the sun. This same God declared through the writing of John that he doesn't just like the world, but he so loved the world. My brothers and my sisters, I've come to remind you that God is really, really, really in love with you. He is passionately in love with you. He is head over heels in love with you. God loves you, not just a little bit, not just on some days, or, or not just when you're doing well, or not just when you're on the mountaintop, but God loves you at all times and a lot. The next time you're feeling down emotionally, tell yourself, I am loved by God. When you, the next time your friends don't return your phone call, say that I am still loved by God. When times get rough, you so that you are still loved by God. When you're feeling lonely, tell yourself that you are loved by God. When sickness is overtaking your body, you got and you begin to think to yourself that God doesn't love you because you're going through all of this. You got to tell yourself in that negative mindset, I am still loved by God. Even while I'm yet still on my sick bed, I am yet still loved by God. When that spouse started act, starts acting strange, tell yourself, I am still loved by God. When your friends don't don't, don't respond to you like you want them to respond to you. Tell yourself that you're still loved by God. You are loved and not just loved, but you are so loved to a great extent by God. The second point that the Lord will have me to lay upon, lay, to share with you all this morning is that not only are you loved by God a lot, but you are loved unconditionally by God. Not only are you loved by God a lot, but you're loved by God unconditionally. The word love in our text is the word agape, which is translated to mean unconditional love. It is not just a love of endearment, like the word filio, which is, the, which is, which is an endearment or an affectionate type of love. Filio is the root word for the word Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. I'm grateful that God didn't just love me with a brotherly type of love. I'm grateful that God just just love us with a filial type of love, an affectionate type of love. But I am grateful that God decided to love me and you and the whole world with an agape type of love, with his unconditional love. Therefore, God's love for you does not change just because just because you dotted all the I's and crossed every T. God's love for you does not increase nor decrease just because you have been naughty or nice. God's love for you does not change because you messed up or you did everything perfectly. God's love for you is constant. So if you are praying and meditating on the word of God every day and throughout the day, God loves you. If the only scripture you know currently is Jesus will, guess what? God still loves you. When things are going well, God loves you. When you're sick, God still loves you. When you have plenty of money in your pocket or your bank account, God loves you. When you're broke, God still loves you. When people are singing your praises, you are still loved by God. When people have turned their backs on you, you are yet still loved by God. When you are doing well mentally, you are loved by God. And when you're feeling low and depressed, you are yet still loved by God. When you do things perfectly well, God loves you. And when you intentionally sin, guess what? God doesn't love the sin, but he still loves you, the sinner. God loves, God's love for you is not dependent upon you making him happy. Let me say that again. God's love for you is not dependent upon you making him happy. His love for you is not dependent upon you proving yourself worthy of his love. His love for you is independent of how you feel about yourself. His love for you is independent of your perceived worthiness. Why? 
Because before you were you, God loved the thought of you. The Bible says before you were born in your mother's womb, God knew you. You were already on God's mind. When you were just a thought, when you were just a potential, before you were you, God loved you. Your sins does not change God's love for you. Your best days don't change God's love for you. Therefore, God's love for you, God loves you simply because he decided to love you. God loves you not for what you can do for him and not for what you may not do. But God loves you simply because he decided to love you. He loves you despite knowing that you have messed up and you will again at one point or another in the future. Mess up once more. And guess what? He still loves you. For God so loved the world in all of this mess, in all of his challenges, in all of his vacillating ways, God still loved the world because his love is unconditional. Not only does God love us a lot. And not only is God's love unconditional, but God wants me to share with you all on this morning that he loves us. We know that he loves us because he shows us that he loves us. God loves us through his actions. We know that God so loved the world and that his love is unconditional. That his love is unconditional and we know that he loves us because he has shown it to us. God gave his only begotten son. But not only that, he allowed his son, Jesus, to live among mankind and to set the record straight that he did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. He allowed his son, who was perfect, to dwell among mankind to show us, to show us the way back to him, the Father, so that, so that he can show us that he loves us. He allowed Jesus to be harassed, mocked, ridiculed, beaten, cru and crucified for sinners like you and me. That's love. But not only that, he allowed Jesus, who knew no sin, to later die for, for our sins. That is love. Let me make it plain and simple. One way you know if you really love someone, if you're willing to give them the last and only of something that you have. Likewise, you know someone loves you if that person is willing to give you their only and last of something like sweet potato pie. If he or she on Thanksgiving Day gave you their only slice of sweet potato pie and you know that they love sweet potato pie, but they gave it to you anyways, that person just might love you. If he, was, if he likes to go fishing on Saturdays, but he gave up his time on a Saturday morning to spend that time with you, rather than go fishing, he just might love you. If she gave you her only slice of red velvet cake, she just might love you. We know that God loves us, not just because it's written, but it is because, and not just because of what we might feel, but we know God loves us because he's personified it in action by giving us his only begotten son. He didn't just give us one of many sons, but he gave us his only son. That's love. He didn't just, he didn't share his son with us, but he gave his only begotten son. That's love. We know that God loves us because he came to the rescue of mankind by being born and dying for our sins. However, we also know that he loves us because he has saved us individually as well as collectively out of things. He has brought you out of some situations that you thought you were not going to be able to get out of. You know that God loves you not just because he has saved you and delivered you, but he also has decided not to condemn you. Verses, verse 17 in the third chapter of John says, For God did not send his son into the world to be condemned, but, but to save the world through him. God did not send his son into the world to, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. If we're honest, we would admit that you have sinned and I have sinned. 
We all are guilty of sin, and that the penalty of sin is death. You did wrong, and I've done wrong. And because of that, you and I deserve to be tried, and based upon our own confession of, a, of admission of sin and guilt, that we should be we, that we should suffer the penalty of death. But God has decided to intervene. Through God through his son, Jesus agreed to pay the penalty for your sins and for my sins with this life. And then he turned around to mankind and says, you know what? I forgive you of your sins. Go and enjoy your life. I will serve your sentence for you. That's a word for someone on this one that God came not to condemn you, but to save you. Why? Because he loves you. The world may condemn you, but God loves you. The world may put you down, but God will lift you up. The world may beat upon you, but God came to cheer you up. The world may give you the evil eye, but God came to tell you that you're the apple of his eye. The world may, be, may reject you, but God came to accept you. The world may try to shut you out, but God came to bring you in. That is why we are to give God praise, glory, and honor because God came not to condemn the world, but he came to save us. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us so much that he couldn't leave us in the sin, sick state that we were in. That, but he decided that he would provide a way of escape. So he came to help us, to save us, to deliver us all and not to condemn us all because he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who he who, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have a lot to be thankful for and another one thing in particular is that you are loved by God. Throughout this week, this upcoming week, when life Weigh weighs upon you. You ought to remember that you are loved by God. Whatever difficulties may come your way this week, remember that you are loved by God. Let us go before the Lord by way of prayer. Father, we thank you that we are loved by you. We thank you, God, for you sending your Son, Jesus the Christ, into the world. To, to communicate to us that you don't sit in judgment against us, but that you love us and you want to come to our rescue to save us, to deliver us, to help us, to lend us a helping hand on the, in, throughout this journey that we call life for God. God, we, it is our prayer that you lift up some bowed head. There might be someone that, that's watching on this morning who is weighted down with the cares of life. Remind them, God, that they are yet still loved. They are not forsaken. They have not been forgotten. But they are loved by you. And they are cared for by you. Oh God, wrap your arms around that brother or that sister that needs to be comforted on this morning. Wrap your arms around Sister Mary E. Smith, who is grieving the loss of her brother, for God. Strengthen her and encourage her like only you can. Strengthen the entire family of Mary E. Smith's brother, for God, as they go through the grief process. God, we ask that you be with Brother Anthony Anderson and Tiffany Johnson and, many, and Anitha Jackson and many others, for God, who are grappling with, with physical illness, continue to provide a healing for them like only you can. We, we know that you are yet still the great physician, and we know that you are yet still the balm in Gilead who can still heal, who can still restore, who can still bring, bring a sense of health and vitality back into those bodies that need to be strengthened, oh God. Lord God, be with every household who's watching on this morning. Meet us and, and them at their points of need. Remind them that even though we are physically distant, we, we, are, we can yet still be spiritually close to one another by way of worship experiences such as the one we participated in on this morning, by way of 
uh, uh, prayer throughout the week or a text message or even a message on Facebook or God or a phone call. Remind them that even though we are physically distant, we can still be socially close and spiritually close, oh God, through technology methods, oh God. God, continue to strengthen my Mariah and be with my Mariah as we continue to be a beacon of light on a hill in this community. Oh God, it is our prayer that you have been glorified throughout this worship experience. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There might be someone who's watching with this morning who don't know the Lord as his or her personal Savior. I encourage you to give the Lord a try. To give Jesus the Christ a try. You tried everything else. Why not try God? If you have not given the Lord Jesus Christ your heart, I encourage you to pray this prayer after me. Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I make you my Lord as well as my Savior. My brother, my sister, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I encourage you to go to our website, my Mariah, um, SC.com, and let us know that you prayed that prayer for the first time by filling out a data form, which, which is located on the bottom half of our webpage, homepage. Or you can email us at mymariahsouthcarolina at gmail.com. Or you can message us by way of our Facebook page. Or send us a message um, by way of YouTube in the, comment, in the comment section, or Facebook in the comment section, and one of, one of our leaders will get in contact with you. If you desire to join the Mount Mariah Baptist Church or be connected with the Mount Mariah Baptist Church by way of baptism or by way of Christian experience, you may also let us know that as well by way of Facebook, a website, or by email.
nothing unto your spirit. We pray that we pray that you heard some song that was encouraging to you, and we pray that the word was enlightening and encouraging as well. And we encourage you to tune in next Sunday at same place and same time. And everyone should be reminded that we have prayer, corporate prayer, every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Friday at 7 a.m. So you have two options to pray with us, with the church, with your church body, your church family, on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. And you may get the prayer, our prayer conference line number, which, which will be listed on the very last slide of today's broadcast. Now let us go before the Lord by way of benediction. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall gently upon your fields. May God hold you in the palm of his hands. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Go in peace.